Okay, we're out here today to do utility pole classification. Usually you just call it pole classification. But as you drive down uh, the road and you see utility poles carrying utility lines alongside the road, you'll notice they may be different sizes, different lengths, different diameters. There's a really important reason we do this. Utility poles typically sell for two or even three times the value that saw timber would at a similar tree size. So often uh, there will be pole buyers that may cruise a stand prior to the timber sale, prior to it even being logged, even for saw timber, pulpwood, and other products, and they may actually pull those utility poles off first. They're such a high value product. Uh, so we're here in about a 95-year-old longleaf pine stand. Longleaf pine makes an excellent utility pole because it doesn't taper very much. It's an excellent self-pruner. And so of all the trees in the U.S. South, it's probably our best tree for utility poles. Uh, that being said, we have a whole lot more loblolly pine than longleaf. So most utility poles that you'll see along the highway are probably loblolly pine in the South. And so we use these complex pole classification tables. Um, and looking at this pole class table, what you'll see is that we're going to grade typically uh, into class 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. And with those classes of poles, one is the better class. You see there that the class 1 poles at a given length are worth the most money compared to the lower classes. Out west, you may get into some H classes as well. Those are going to be for pilings like you might use to construct piers with. Uh, because they have larger trees out west. Typically, we don't see as many piling logs coming out of the eastern United States. We just don't have trees that are quite large enough for that. Um, when you want to go classify a tree to see if it can make a utility pole, um, so got a couple students here to help out. And so the first thing you all want to do, uh, if you want to take a look at this tree, you've seen utility poles on the highway, right? So you don't see utility poles that are, you know, real curved, real crooked. So go ahead and take a look at this tree. You want to walk all the way around it, and you're looking for things that would make it so it couldn't even be a utility pole. So you're looking for too much sweep. You're looking for signs of rot. Um, you can't make it. You don't see fork utility poles either, so you would have to cut it off below a fork. So as we look at this tree, I think that could make a utility pole? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this looks like it will make a utility pole. Um, and typically what we're going to see in the U.S. South, uh, we have a lot of 35, 40, 45 foot uh, class 3, 4, 5 poles. So we tend to have shorter poles and lower class poles, especially with all the pine plantations that we have around now. Some of those plantations may be harvested early enough, they, they honestly don't ever get to the point they produce utility poles. So pole buyers may be looking for older stands or even naturally regenerated older stands uh, to find poles in because you need a little bit of a bigger tree. Okay, so here's the next thing that you want to do. If you do have some sweep, uh, we're going to use what we call the magical string test. So you look at a tree, and we're looking at a photo of a tree here. You look up all the way at the top where you think you would cut that utility pole off, and you, you tie a magical string to the top center of the tree, and it hangs straight down like a plumb line. And so you can see the line on the screen here. Um, now, if that line at any point comes outside of the bark of the bowl of the tree, that tree is too curved to make a pole. That's too much sweep. So at that point, either the tree can't make a pole because of the sweep in it, or what you can try doing is looking at a lower point on that tree. And you may be able to make a shorter utility pole, which would allow them to buck the log and cut the sweep off of it so that it doesn't have too much sweep. Um, ideally, even a shorter utility pole is probably going to be worth more than saw timber, so that would, would be a tree you still might want to sell as utility pole if you have the market for it. At certain times, say we have a hurricane, that increases the demand for poles. There may be more demand out there where there's more poles being bought. At other times, there you know, may have not been any ice storms, uh, hurricanes for quite some time. There may be a lull in the market for poles, so it all just depends on what your lo local market is for poles. Okay, so we've looked at this tree. We didn't have to do the string test, anything like that on it. Um, so our next step, let's go ahead and let's get the diameter. And we may want Wyatt to help us out with this. Because what you do, you're going to want not even the diameter, but the circumference. Pole classification is a little different. You want the circumference. And uh, what height do we have for DBH? 4.5 feet. 4.5 feet, exactly. Uh, but you do this at 6 feet. Okay. So you need to know 6 feet. So we're, we're having Wyatt help us out with this one. 
Um, and so the first time you do this, you may want to do exactly uh, what Wyatt's doing here. You may want to even measure six feet up the tree um, and see where that is, because we all know where DBH is on us. We may not know where six feet is. Um, and then once you do that once, it's like DBH, you may know it's the top of your head, or if you're real tall, your nose, um, or for many of us, over the top of your head a little bit. So six feet's going to be up there. So a little all bit right. different. So right there, forehead level for Y. Yep. Perfect. Okay, and so then you go ahead and you get circumference. So you got to look at the tape you're using. And if you're using a D tape, it's going to give you the diameter, not the circumference. But we're going to want the circumference. So take a look at that tape. Does it have a just inches on one side of it? Yes, it does. It has circumference. Perfect. Yep. Yeah, just linear inches is all you need. And if you have a D tape, you could use it. You're just going to want to either convert the tables you're using or you'll want to just multiply the number you get by pi, because, of course, pi times diameter equals circumference. So, okay. so let's go ahead and wrap it around this tree up there at six feet in height. Yes. All right. You're just going to have to flip the tape over to it. Oh, that's fine. It doesn't matter if it's upside down, as long as you can read it. Okay. And you can always just hug the tree with it, too, and pull it to yourself. That's a quicker way to do it sometimes. Okay, so okay. we've walked all the way around the tree here. And then and what do we get? Got three feet and eight inches. Okay, so three feet and eight inches, so that's 36 inches plus the eight. So we're at 44 uh, inches. And then what's the decimal? You even want to go to decimal on this. So it is actually, it's actually right on the dot. Okay, so we lucked out here, 44.0 inches. So we want to note 44.0 inches. Uh, did you measure that outside the bark or inside the bark, Wyatt? Outside the bark. Okay, that's of course an outside the bark measurement. We don't want to measure inside the bark. You might kill the tree. Um, but for pole classification, often we're going to use an inside the bark measurement. We have a real simple trick for that. Subtract five inches. And that roughly takes off that bark thickness off the circumference for you. So we had 44 inches outside the bark. So inside the, the bark, we would be at... 39 inches. 39 inches. All right, perfect. So that's what we use, 39.0 inches. That's the number that we're going to look up on this table. Okay? Uh, so you can put the tape down. We're good. If you did want to be very precise with that, you could measure this 44-inch circumference. You could actually bring a bark gauge with you and use a bark gauge, but using the 5-inch rule is much quicker and easier. Okay. Um, so you want to check out the, the table here. Take a look at that, Hannah. And so we got 39.0 inches. Um, so as we look at this table here, you can start seeing, and we'll put the table up on the screen here for you too, how long of a class one pole could we make? Um, 35 feet. Yeah, so we can make a 35 foot class one pole, but if you look at class two, how long a class two pole could we have? So could we make a 40 foot class two pole? Um, yes. We could, because the, the minimum circumference it needs is 38.5 inches. And so now we know kind of the sort of products that we're looking at out of this pole, what's possible based on that circumference. So look at the dollar table at the bottom. So if we made a 35-foot class 1 pole, what's that worth? $106. Okay, $106, but what would the 40-foot class 2 pole be worth? Class 2, 40-foot is going to be 133, right? Yes, sorry. There we go. And so, generally speaking, the longer the pole you can make, even at a lower class, the higher value it is. So, really, once you get that circumference, you just jot it down. You don't really need it until we start looking at tree height. Okay, um, so we've gotten the circumference of our tree. We've checked it for sweep. Um, then we need to get a height. There are several different things that could uh, cause us to have to cut off the top of the pole at a certain height. One of those things is a fork. So as you look at this fork tree right here, what you would do is look at the, the place where you can first see light between that fork, and you would drop five feet below that because that's approximately where the pith would have split. So that's how you handle a fork. You have to cut it off there. A fork and a split pith and a utility pole. Well, why we're cutting them off is if you have a weak point and you don't cut them off at that weak point, that's where they're going to break in a hurricane. That's going to be high up in the pole, too, because that's they're going to put the big end of the tree down, little end up. And so that's also going to be where you're going to have transformers, the lines, everything. You really don't want them breaking there. Um, and so we'll cut them off with a fork. If you did have some sweep, here you see an example of some sweep. If you needed to lower it with the string test that we already discussed, you would do that. 
okay? In many trees, the most common thing that's going to cause you to cut them off will be branching. And so what you're really looking for, there are very specific rules for this, um, but you can really just eyeball it as the first whirl you get of really large branches because that's going to cause knots. The knots are a weak point, and that weak point is where the pole would actually break in, in a wind event. And so uh, there are lots of different examples to look at, but you're looking for either one really big branch that's going to cause a huge knot, something like a ramicorn, which is an excessively steeply angled, excessively large branch, or you're looking for a number of large limbs in a whirl around the tree. Um, finally, the last thing that you'll use to cut off the top height of your utility pole is going to be the diameter. There is a minimum top diameter. You're rarely going to get to that. Most commonly, you're going to see it get knocked off by limbs before you have to knock it off based on the diameter. And as we look at our pole class tables here, you can see for the minimum circumference at top and inches, for class one pole, it's going to be 27 inches, 25 for a top, for a class two pole. Uh, but, you know, as foresters, that's even difficult for us, right? To stand on the ground, look up at the tree, and eyeball a 25-inch circumference. That, that's not practical, right? Um, so if you're using this practically, what you probably want to do is divide those numbers by pi and write your diameters in there because it's much easier to eyeball a diameter from the ground than it is to think about it in terms of circumference. Of course, once you do a lot of pole class, you could get used to using circumference rather than diameter. But for beginners, that, that's what I'd recommend there. Okay, um, so as you look at this tree here, uh, we can see we've got a couple different ways to estimate height. So as we look at this one, you can see it's starting to get a bunch of large limbs. Particularly, there's going to be one really large limb that comes out this side of the tree. You can see up there, and it kind of curves up and out. That's probably where I would cut off the top of this one. All the branches below that are going to be generally smaller in diameter, and you may not be as worried about cutting it off for them. So that's probably where I would cut this off. Okay, so now we know where we want to cut this tree off. We're going to top this one off based on limit. Now you need to know the total length of that pole, right? So we can assume a one-foot stump will be cut, and so all we need to know is the height at that point minus a foot. So there's two different ways we can do that. Uh, so Hannah's going to show us the fancy way here with this Hegloff digital hypsometer. And so you can see we've already put the, the puck, if you will, um, the, the acoustic sensor there on the tree. And so Hannah will just look through that just like you would with a clinometer. And so as you look through that, uh, you can hopefully see the tree. You look up at that spot. And if we've got this thing calibrated correctly, which we did beforehand, um, it's just going to read out the height for you at that spot. It, it measures the angle. It knows how far you are away based on acoustics. And it tells us that's so many feet in the air. That's, that's the quick, easy way using technology. Why it's going to show us the lower tech way using an old school clinometer. And so that's why we have the loggers tape here that we've set up. And so we know how many feet we are away from the tree. We've gone 66 feet away. And so we'll use the topo scale on this tree. So go ahead and shoot the down angle there. And you shoot the up angle to that exact spot. Not the total height, but the spot where we're going to cut it off. So what angles did you get? Uh, 52 feet. And what was the down angle? Two. Two. So that makes the math real easy for us, right? Where we know we looked 52 up and two down. We're at 66 feet. We're using the topo scale. So we know that point occurs 50 feet up on the tree. And that works pretty well. What number did you get on that, Hannah? Yeah, so they're working pretty similarly. Um, you may be a little bit more precise with the Hagloff. Just because of the clinometer, it can be a little trickier to see through it. Um, but we know we also have a one-foot stump, so we know we're at a 49 feet there. So can we make a 50-foot pole out of a 49-foot log? No. no. So we always have to drop it down to the lowest class. So now what we know from this tree is that the, the biggest pole we can make out of it is going to be a 45-foot long pole. And we remember that our circumference inside the bark was 39 inches. Now is when we really go to the tables to start doing this. And so as we start looking at this, so I want to look at 45 feet because I know the longest pole I can make is going to give us the most money usually. And so what I can see is for a class 2 45-foot pole, I would need 40.5 inches circumference inside the bark. We don't have that. We have 39. So what I have to make here is a class 3 45-foot pole, which is 37.5 inch minimum diameter. And so I go look at that, and for 45-foot class 3, 
it's telling me off these values for a green pole that would yield me $133. Now what I could look, this is kind of an interesting circumstance on this pole. I could also make a, a class two pole that's 40 feet long, so I could cut it five feet shorter, but make it a better class pole because I can look at that and the minimum diameter there is 38.5 inches. So that's still doable. And that yields me the same $133 in this particular table. So in this case, you could kind of go either way, but what you'll notice on this table in most cells where you go up a row, so you make it five feet shorter and you go over to the left a column, so you make it a higher class, the number goes down. So typically a longest pole is gonna be the most money you could make. In this particular case, when you get good at this and you know your markets, you might just happen to know which of those poles might be the best for you to cut in that scenario. But you have to know your markets. So, um, One final thing you could do once you know the height is you could go do the string test again and just double check that you don't have too much sweep uh, there. But that's how you do pole classification. Um, and later in field station, we'll get to go to a uh, pole mill. So you'll see how they take these trees, they debark them, uh, they cut them and they, they drill the holes for the different uh, electrical utility equipment that's going to go on them. And then they'll treat them uh, with a variety of chemicals, one of which is creosote, so that they won't rot and then that they sell them. So, um, so these tables we've used, you can see they're from ANSI. Um, so utility poles are an engineered product. They have engineering standards that they follow, which is why we use such detailed tables, uh, because they need to be safe when we put them out. Uh, to hold up utility lines. So.